Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series. This is lesson number two in that series, entitled God's Mission, My Mission. And this lesson number two for October 14 of 2023 is entitled God's Mission to Us, Part Two. Okay, so last week we talked about part one. Now we're going to talk about part two. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father in heaven, as we open your word once again to discover the um, um, unbelievable real ways in which you have reached out to us as human beings and tried to preserve your, the knowledge, the true, true knowledge about you down through the generations. We are so blessed at our point in time to have so many witnesses to, to speak to us. May these witnesses speak loudly and clearly th today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All through Scripture, we note that God has done everything He can to establish and maintain a relationship with the human family. He has gone to incredible lengths to try to convince us to follow His ways, which of course are the right ways, the best ways. At the time of the flood, He preserved Noah and his family because He was about to lose contact with the human race completely. Later, He called Abraham because Abraham was surrounded by idolaters. And the story goes on. But fortunately, we know the end of the story, just in case you're losing faith or you're losing confidence. Jim? First John 3, verse 2. My dear friends, we are now ch God's children, but it is not your cl yet clear what we shall become. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he really is. The American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Okay, see him as he really is. What does that imply? It implies two very important things. We haven't seen him very clearly yet. First Corinthians 13 says, what, is that what? We see through a glass darkly, right? No, and it also implies that someday when we see him as he really is, it will transform us. God's ultimate plan for those who do choose to do things his way is for them to become, quote, partakers of the divine nature. That is a, an expression from scripture, and it's repeated, I think, 780 times in the writings of Ellen White. But now in our sinful condition, God has to work through various media and work around the sin problem to try to reach us. All the while, Satan and his associates are working hard to separate us from God. Carrie? Uh, reading from Isaiah 59, 2, it is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. That's from the Good News Bible. Well, God could have assigned the task of spreading the good news to human beings using angels. He could have said, you humans are doing a lousy job, I'll just give the job to angels. However, we need that experience ourselves. We need to experience God's love and experience what it means to share what that love, I'm sorry, to share that love with others. A careful look through scriptures, especially the Gospel of John and some of Paul's letters, make it clear that all three members of the Godhead are busy at work in that effort which began before this world was created. Ephesians 1, 4 from Good News Bible. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be His through our union with Christ so that we would be holy and without fault before Him. And 1 Peter 1, 20, <clears throat> He had been chosen by God before the creation of the world and was revealed in these last days for your sake. Good of course, that would, be, that would be speaking about Jesus. From our limited human perspective, it's hard to imagine why God would have created Adam and Eve if He already knew all that was going to happen. But He did. And now He's engaged in an all-out effort to woo and convert and preserve as many of us as possible. Of course, the most important effort that God undertook to win us back was the sending of His Son. 
He did it at the right time. Galatians 4, 4 calls it the fullness of time. So God looked down, let's talk about that for a moment. God looked down on a world that was involved in every kind of evil that one can possibly imagine. If you do a little looking into what was going on in religious circles in those days, it's just beyond belief. At the same time, he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees with such a rigid understanding of what a right relationship with God would be and how to carry it out that nobody would be attracted. Just before he died, so another way to say that is the ditch is just as deep on both sides of the road. Just before he died and was resurrected and returned to heaven, Jesus told his disciples, John 14, 26, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and make you remember all that I have told you. Thank goodness, because my memory's bad. So the Holy Spirit was given the job of coordinating God's outreach to us human beings. John chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. When, however, the Spirit comes, who reveals the truth about God, he will lead you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak of what he hears and will tell you of things to come. He will give you, give me glory because he will take a, what I say and tell it to you. Good news Bible. And of course, what's his plan? The, the, the Holy Spirit's plan is to give it to us so that we can share it with others. others. Right. Even though the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, the mission-focused evidence involving all three persons of Godhead are numerous. For instance, after his resurrection, Christ appeared to his disciples and promised them, I'm going to send you another, uh, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but st stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. He, here we find the reality of the Godhead's missions in one sentence. The Father's promise, the Son's assurance, and the fulfillment of the promise, and the promise itself, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Okay. From Luke, good. Go ahead. Luke chapter, by the way, Muslims believe in the Holy Spirit. Um, Luke chapter 24, verse 49, and I myself will send upon you what my Father has promised, but you must wait in the city, Jerusalem, until the power from above comes down upon you. Acts 1, 4, 5, 4, 5 and verse 8, and when they came together, he gave them this order, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift I told you about the gift my father promised. John baptized you with water, but a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with the power and you will be witness for me in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I have a question I want you to think about. You don't necessarily need to answer right now. We know that when the Holy Spirit came down on, and at Pentecost, what happened? They were given the ability to speak in any language they, wanted, they communicated with for the rest of their lives, no matter where they were. Later, Peter says, uh, Cornelius' family received the Spirit just as we did. Does that mean they also had that ability to tell the truth to anyone in any language? Did they and, become missionaries throughout the world? We well, not I'm, just, I'm just asking. And later, in Ephesus, a group of people were given the Holy Spirit there. And, you know, it, it implies the same thing. So were there, and maybe there were other times, were there other people who had that experience? But speaking in tongues is not the only... No, no. I, I'm, I'm saying, you know, all that is involved with that. The gift of languages, but Pentecost, people from all over the then yeah. world came. Yeah. So yeah. there was the necessity 
to be able to, but right. gift of spirit is gift of love. Yeah. Well, something to think about. Yes. Later on a mountain, in mountainside in Galilee, he told them, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, the 11 disciples went to the hill in Galilee where Jesus had told them to go. And Ellen White says, about 500 people were there. When they saw him, they worshiped him, even though some of them doubted. So you can imagine if, you know, as how popular he was in Galilee, if somebody says after he's dead and rose from the, from the grave and so forth, and everybody is just completely bamboozled by this idea, and then the rumor gets around that he's going to appear on a certain mountain somewhere. Mm -hmm. How many people do you think showed up? Good. Well, Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority on heaven and on earth. Go then to, to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Make them my disciples. While the Matthew 28 passage is a familiar one that most of us memorized at, the same, at, memorized at some time, similar passages are found in Mark 16, 15 and 16, Luke 24, 44 through 49, and John 20, verses 21 to 23. So every one of the Gospels has some version of this call to go out and spread the good news. Um, Jim, Bible study guide. Disciple making is the primary focus of the Great Commission and the main task of mission. Literally, in the original Greek language, Matthew 28, 19 says, having gone, therefore, make disciples. Therefore, give to the commission its foundation on what has been presented, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus' power, authority, and sovereignty, all these coming from the victory attained in his resurrection. So what they're saying there is that, okay, because I, Jesus saying, because I have all authority and power and everything, I now give you the ability to go and do what I'm asking you to do. Think about the Great Commission for a moment. It would have been impossible for the 12 initial disciples, even if Judas was still with them, to have reached out to the entire world. So we must recognize that that commission is universal in its scope. God intended for every one of us to be involved. There are no geographical, social, or ethnic limitations. So Revelation 14, 6 and 7, Carrie. I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to, be, to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud vi voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay. From the Bible Study Guide, it says, this is the only place in Scripture in which the words eternal and gospel are connected. The gospel is the good news of grace offered to all through Jesus Christ. He came into our world to show us grace and truth. He lived a sinless life and died on the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice quote-unquote quote substitutionary sacrifice, it says, to bear the penalty of our sins. He rose to life, returned to heaven, was exalted by the Father, and today intercedes for us in the heavenly sanctuary. He will soon fulfill his greatest promise to return in majesty and glory, and ultimately, after the millennium, to establish God's kingdom on earth. These are all essential realities of the eternal gospel from the Bible study guide. Okay. So what is a substitutionary sacrifice? A, simpler, a simple answer is that Christ died to take our place, suffering the consequences of sin. To go into more detail, Jesus is the only one who has died the terrible death prophesied in Genesis 2.17. Elsewhere in the Bible, it is called the second death, the death from which human beings for human beings, there is no resurrection. But because Jesus himself was God, he could rise up in his own power and return to his Father's throne in heaven. 
You can read about that in Desire of Ages 785. Many people have the idea that God is somehow angry with us and is determined to punish someone, and so Jesus died in our place. That is a pagan concept. Now let's look at the verses that the Bible gives us to look at and see what they actually say to us. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne. All the while we thought that the, his suffering was punishment sent by God. But because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. Okay. Notice that it says, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. What does that mean? Misunderstood it. It wasn't. We misunderstood. It was not punishment sent by God. God death, doesn't punish or destroy. Yeah. Death is a natural result of sin. Romans 6.23 should have been in there, but I the put it in. The consequence of yeah. living out of harmony, yeah. out, out of a state of atonement. For sin pays its wage, death. It's simple as that. But God's free gift is eternal life in union with Jesus, Christ Jesus our Lord, from our Good News Bible again. God cannot change the fact that sin causes death without changing his entire form of government. And I heard, well, some of you have heard this as well, one of my former teachers said, well, God could save everybody. All he has to do is turn heaven into a solitary confinement penitentiary, put each one of us into our little silent cells, and have the angels come around and stuff some food in once or twice a day, so that keep us like that so we can't hurt each other. That's a misunderstanding. <laughs> that metaphor is a misunderstanding of God's character. Yeah. God, it, without freedom, you don't have love, and there ain't no freedom in if you're in, a, in a cubicle. Nevertheless, the fact that this message is eternal is remarkable. There's only one gospel that can save us. It will remain the same until the mission of God is fully accomplished. There will never be another gospel. Deceitful teachings and doctrines come and go, but the message of salvation, the eternal gospel, is unchanging, and those who believe and live it in obedience will be rewarded. Deuteronomy 5 and Romans 3. Um, Romans 2, I'm sorry, Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday. So what part do we have in accomplishing the goal of bringing this whole evil story to an end? God is calling us to be disciples, loving, honest, devoted disciples who are determined as far as possible to do His will in our lives. More than that, we are challenged to spread that good news about God to all around us. We, there are so many verses in the Bible that say basically that the gospel needs to go to the whole world. Okay, how long is it going to take for that to happen? It's going to take a long time unless some people start doing it. Unfortunately, many people have the idea that the work of evangelizing and bringing other people into the church is primarily the work of the pastor. One church leader that I knew once said that we should measure the success of a pastor not by the number of people that she or he baptizes, but by the number of people that those people bring to Christ. What do you think of that criteria? Do all around us recognize that we are Christians? A day is going to come when we are not going to count anymore. Um, yeah, not going to be able to. Yeah, we're not going to be. Uh, in a day, a nation is born, and mm -hmm. that day is coming is okay, right here. You're... John chapter 13, verse 34, 35. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. What does that say about everybody else? They're not loving, right? And go ahead and read the next verse. 2 Corinthians 5, mm -hmm. 17. Anyone who is joined in Christ is a new being. The old one is gone, the new has come. Way back in Enoch's day, he walked with God. Abraham was blessed by God, and God promised that through him, he would bless all nations. Genesis 12, 1 to 3 puts it in these words. The Lord said to Abram, 
leave your country, your relatives, and your father's home, where they're all practicing idolatry, we might add, and go to a land that I'm going to show you, which is also full of idolaters. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I, bless, I will bless all the nations. Deuteronomy 7, 6 and 11 through 12. Do this because you belong to Yahweh, the Lord, your God. From all the peoples on earth, he chose you to be his own special people. So now obey what you have been taught. Obey all the laws that I have given you today. If you listen to these commands, Jim, there you are, and obey them faithfully, then the Lord your God will continue to keep his covenant with you and will show you his constant love as he promised your ancestors. God's covenant with Abraham and his descendants had a specific purpose. They were called, created, and commissioned to be agents of God's mission, channels of blessing to the nations. Compare with Deuteronomy 28.10, Isaiah 49.6. However, they were chosen with a covenant relationship with God based on an implied conditionality of faith and obedience, obedience I would say a willingness to listen. Mm -hmm. In this process, that of attracting the surrounding nations to Israel was God's mission strategy, strategy in the Old Testament okay. from the Bible study guide. God chose the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, from one, for one specific purpose. They were to spread the truth about God, the gospel message, to the entire world. Carrie? Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people, a people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests. And that's from the Good News Bible. But unfortunately, as we know, the Jewish people did not accomplish what they were supposed to do. So the disciples, including Peter, understood that the challenge was passed on to Christians. Gordon? First Peter 2, 9, but you, that is Christians, are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Good News okay. Bible. So exactly the words that God has spoken to the children of Israel, now Peter is passing on to us as Christians. God's appointed church, his faithful people, now are the ones to carry the message to everyone in the world. Ellen White, Myra? The mission of the church of Christ is to save perishing sinners. Heal. Mm -hmm. It's to heal perishing sinners. It is to make known the love of God to men and to win them to Christ by the efficacy of that, of that love. What a responsibility. You know, there's no text that you, that, if it's properly translated, no text that Jesus said that what the efficacy, using that word, of his death would be. Mm -hmm. He did explain uh, that, uh, that it would be bring peace, but, uh, <laughs> It's no, I'm going to pay the penalty and you guys are all going to be paid up. That's a pagan concept that has infected all of theology. We have already looked at Matthew 28, 18 to 20 of the Gospel Commission. Look at comparison, Revelation 14, 6. Charles? Then I saw another angel flying in the air with an everlasting, eternal message of God's news, good news, to announce to the people of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. Clearly, God intends to, tends to reach out through His church to every part of the world. As we know from the Greek wording of the Great Commission itself, the disciples were given three areas to which they were supposed to reach out eventually. So, area one, you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Acts 1.8. They had a big job to do in Jerusalem, but they were fairly successful. How many were baptized in one day? 3,000. 3,000. Area two, 
They were to carry the gospel to Judea and Samaria. They were also fairly good at reaching out to those areas. Those were people who spoke a language similar to their own and had a similar culture. So that was, should have been fairly easy for them to reach out. But area three, beyond that, Christ challenged, challenged them to go to the ends of the earth. That would include all languages, all cultures, all places, all nations, all people groups, and all ethnicities. That challenge is ours. In this series of lessons, we are going to be given specific challenges. Here are the challenges for this lesson. Challenge one, pray every day this week for the community where you live. God has placed you there for a reason. Challenge up, research the demographics of your area. What kind of people live among you, around you? ethnic and religious background, old, young, poor, wealthy, languages spoken, and so on. Ask God to show you how you may be a channel of His love to them. Our Bible study guide for Thursday. Okay, Ellen White from the chapter entitled For Witness Unto All Nations. The Savior's words, you are the light of the world, point to the fact that He has committed to His followers a worldwide mission. As the rays of the sun penetrate to the remotest corners of the globe, so God designs that the light of the gospel shall extend to every soul upon the earth. If the Church of Christ were fulfilling the purpose of our Lord, light would be shed upon all that sit in darkness and in the region and shadow of death, instead of congregating together and shunning responsibility and cross-bearing. The members of the Church would scatter into all lands, letting the light of Christ shine out from them, working as he did for the salvation of souls. And this gospel of the kingdom would speedily be carried to all the world. So we're not supposed to stay in Loma Linda? Oh, it sounds like... We're not like, supposed to stay in the United States? Yes. From all countries, the Macedonian call is sounding, come over and help us. God has opened fields be, before us. Heavenly beings have been cooperating with men. Providence is going before us, and divine power is working with human effort. Blind indeed must be the eyes that do not see the working of the Lord, and deaf the ears that do not hear the call of the true shepherd to his sheep. Some have heard the call of God and have responded. Let every sanctified heart now respond by seeking to proclaim the life-giving message. If men and women, in humility and faithfulness, will give up their God-given appointed work, I'm sorry, will take up their God-given appointed work, Divine power will be revealed in the conver conversion of many to the truth. Wonderful will be the results of their efforts. This is a comment from Ellen White, very near the end of her life, Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, November 14, 1912. So how are we doing as a Seventh-day Adventist witnesses in our world? I think our world includes San Bernardino County. Well, that's a start anyway. <laughs> You think it does or it doesn't? It does. I yes. think it, That's I, Judea. Okay. So the people, do the people around us even know that we exist? They do know they we're vegetarian. Do they have any idea what we believe and why? No. Oh, I would say a good percentage of the people that work over there don't. Do people around us think that we are strange or queer? Some do. Or do they, based on some fortunate event, have a good opinion of our church? I can tell you that there's one non adventist family who were excited about what we're doing here at Loma Linda and donated $100 million. Well, if not, what are we doing to change that? Do we fully agree that God has given us these challenges? Even the first disciples and the half-brothers of Jesus there were, even among them, there were questions about whether Gentiles should be allowed to become church members until they were circumcised and practiced all the Jewish requirements. I mean, we're talking about the original church leaders, okay? How this about the church leaders today? You didn't have to ask that question. I did. <laughs> How about the church followers today? Yeah. So this is a major issue. If you don't, if you don't think so, Read Acts 15, 1 to 29, and Galatians 2, 11 to, let's just read one of those. Let's look at Galatians 2, 11 to 14. But when Peter came to Antioch, and now Antioch was the home church for who? Paul. Paul and, si and Silas and Barnabas. 
When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him in public because he was clearly wrong. Before some men who had been sent by James, that was Jesus' brother, older brother, arrived there, Peter had been eating with the Gentile brothers and sisters. But after these men arrived, he drew back and would not eat with the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who were in favor of circumcising them. The other Jewish brothers and sisters also started acting like cowards along with Peter, and even Barnabas was swept along by their cowardly action. When I saw that they were not walking a straight path in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, in front of them all, is this an example we should follow? Mm -hmm. In front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you have been living like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How then can you try to force Gentiles to live like Jews? Oh. That was a spirited general conference session. Yeah. That was the first general conference session. <laughs> there you are. Right. Well, so for an even deeper understanding of the challenges that they faced, look at 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 or Romans 14. If you understand that fully, you'll have a huge understanding of the issues that were facing the early church. And I could add to more of that. Look at uh, Acts the Apostles, uh, starting with about page 399 and read up to page 405, and you'll see something else that happened in that light, in this same sort of thing. So here, these are the people who were disciples of Jesus. These are the people who spent the time with him, the people who baptized 3,000 people apparently in one day or converted 3,000 people. And yet, look at what's going on. Try to imagine the challenge facing the disciples as they moved into brand new territory surrounded by pagan people and tried to spread the gospel. What did they say or what did they do to get people's attention? Is that for me? What would you do if you went to, okay, let's, let's take somebody now. Let's drop you down in the middle of China right now. What would you do? Run for help. <laughs> run, run for help. Try to talk to them, and you find out you don't speak their language. So you well, I mean, just let, let's assume that you have the gifts that these people had, that oh, you could okay, speak well, any language I and understand. Let's just start with that. Okay, what are you going to say? What are you going to do? Currently, they say their uh, financial stuff in China is not very well. Yeah. They've probably got... And in there somewhere about growing your own food or something like that. Now, There's a variety of things. Now they're trying to force the, the Tibetans to become Chinese, just like they're trying to force the Uyghurs to become Chinese. Okay, well, let's go back to our, our issue here. What did, what did Jesus say, in this case, through Peter himself, Mark 16, verses 15 to 20? Who's next? I Gordon, I think it's you. He said to them, go throughout the whole world and preach the gospel to the whole human race. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. It's kind of straightforward. Believers will be given the power to perform miracles. They will drive out demons in my name. They will speak in many, they will speak in strange tongues. If they pick up snakes, or drink any poison, they will not be harmed. They will place their hands on sick people who will get well. After the Lord Jesus had talked with them, he was taken up to heaven and sat at the right side of God. The disciples went and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and proved that their preaching was true by the miracles that were performed. Okay, now I'm gonna ask That's this a scary a thought. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a question. Do you remember what kind of miracles Paul did in Ephesus? Was it a snake? No, that was not that was an island of Malta. That right. was in Malta. That with the snake correct. thing. Yeah. Shipwreck. In Ephesus, he, he, tra he, remember, he created such a stir in Ephesus that they wanted to kill him. They were sure that he was going to stop people from going to the Temple of Artemis. They would, people would be healed by simply touching a handkerchief that Paul had used. People were healed by merely touching a handkerchief that Paul had used. Now, is the ability to perform miracles a good test of whether someone is telling the truth about God? 
No. How come <laughs> that we, didn't, that how didn't come take, we both answered the same? Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Okay. Controversy. Myra, I guess you're going to give us this, the verses there in the Bible. Okay, Matthew 24, 24. Okay, let, let me interrupt before, before you go on. Okay. It, there's no question about the fact that a miracle gets attention. It got it every time Jesus performed miracles, every time Paul, Peter, it gets attention. Okay, go ahead. Okay. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear, and they will perform great miracles mm -hmm. and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. So who's going to be performing miracles? False messiahs and false prophets. We don't have any of those, do we? <laughs> They've been around for millennia. Yeah. Okay, so what does it mean, perform great miracles? What do you think that means? I mean, this similar. is what the Bible says. Yeah. I would guess it would be something similar to what we saw Christ do in healing yeah. people. Okay. And people okay. are healing now in the oh, yeah. television and yeah. it's full of it. Up so, here to raise the dead. Yeah. Okay, well, let's try another version of that story. Revelation 13. The second beast, apostate Protestantism, performed great miracles. It made fire come down out of heaven to earth in the sight of everyone. Mm. Okay. How's that going to happen? Are we going to see miracles performed? I mean, what is this basically saying? What this is basically, these two verses tell us that Satan is going to be allowed to perform miracles. Of what nature and to what extent, how remarkable, we don't know for sure. But we've got to know to the law and to the testimony. Well, I'm not, now, so. when it comes to, you know, okay, these people are going to perform miracles, some of them, and then they're going to try to say, okay, because I have this ability to perform miracles, then you need to believe what I say. At that point, we have a tool. Well, not just a tool. We have the inspiration. We have God's Word. We can, we can say, okay, I don't care what... The miracle may be great, and you say, God bless you if you actually heal somebody, but if you're, telling, if you're not telling the truth... It is we're not, but we're not like buying that, right? it. That's when you have to listen to all ten points, not just nine of them, because that tenth one will be the one that you should have paid attention to. Yeah. <laughs> and also, you know, it says only those who have fortified themselves yeah. with the Word of God daily. Yeah. yeah. Will Great controversy, 593. Right. I am sure that performing miracles got attention. I mean, this, it's, it's clear for many places in the Bible. But we need to be wary, okay? Charles, that's yours, I think. No, it's mine. No. A review of discipleship literature reveals three essential dimensions or processes of every effective approach to discipleship. Rational, relational, and missional dimensions. Now, those are long, fancy words for different things. Let's see if we can understand them. The rational or learning dimension, okay, listening, Jim, Dimension of discipleship is a process by which a believer intentionally learns from Jesus. In its original context, disciple mathetes referred to someone who apprenticed with a teacher. That person would attach himself to a teacher for the purpose of acquiring both theoretical and practical knowledge. The rational dimension stresses the need for continuing metamorphosis and growth, even for those who have already become disciples. So, okay, what is metamorphosis? Have you all gone through a metamorphosis? Changing. That means a change, a transformation. A big transformation. A big transformation, because like the change from a caterpillar to a butterfly. That's the traditional thing we talk about. So, okay, so that means that people who sit in the pews in the church and don't say anything are going to become missionaries? Is that a metamorphosis? It would be, if it happened. Don't put it, if it happened. Come on now. Okay. When, when it happens, it will. When it happens, okay. I like that better. And Matthew, uh, because teaching, that word in Matthew 28, 19, is an ongoing process, 
The rational dimension of discipleship is a lifelong process of learning and growing. And Ellen White just said, sanctification is the what? Lifelong work, process. work of a lifetime. Um, however, the goal of this continual learning is not only to impart knowledge, but also to instill total commitment to Jesus. We're not supposed to just sit, sit in and absorb everything that we teach. And, I mean, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good that if we're well informed. Well, what's, what should happen? Jesus says, if you're full of the teaching, you, 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 you should be telling it to someone else. So then we go to the relation or the community dimension of discipleship develops in the context of a supportive community where accountability can take place. Um, Ellen White in one place says something very interesting that I would like to see happen. She says, we should have church services where instead of the pastor preaching, all the, when, whoever wants to do so from the church congregation stands up and tells what God has done for them and in his ability to reach out to others in the previous week. Can you imagine? What are they doing? Something like that during Jesus' time that he put the cloth on his head and he stood up and he read. Yeah, well, no, Jesus did it. Yeah, I'm, did. I'm just did. asking how many of us are doing it. <laughs> no, the, oh. well, the pastor. The, okay. But anyways. Well, let's be honest. The New Testament portrays a very dynamic communal culture in early Christian church because of the believer's understanding of disciple making as a relational process. Because of its Old Testament roots, the early church continued to emphasize kinship as one of its core values. What was different about this New Testament, this new community, was that kinship was not defined in terms of bloodlines. You don't have to be a descendant of Abraham through the bloodlines and ethnicity, but rather in terms of shared faith and fellowship in Christ. The church became an environment of inclusion and acceptance. Let's look at, hold on, let's look at that for just a second. Notice this verse that it tells us to look at. Galatians 3, 28, and I'm going to read verse 29 as well. So what happened in those churches? Remember, there were no church buildings. They met together in people's homes. They fellowshiped together. They ate together. They, they went out together. So, and, and, and when they really developed that kind of a kinship, this is what happened. So there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. What is Paul trying to say to us there? Okay, all the good Jewish people said, if you're a descendant of Abraham, what happens? You're in. You're in. Absolutely. And he said, what? If you're a member of this kind of relationship within the Christian church, you're in. Membership was open to all on the basis of professing faith in Christ as Savior and the public demonstration through water baptism of complete allegiance to Christ from our Bible study guide. Review what you know about how the early churches were, were organized. They met in individual homes. We talked about that. They did not have church buildings. They ate together. They talked together. They worshiped together. The early disciples called them a family or even a part of the body of Christ. And, and the Sabbath was a 24-hour celebration. Mm -hmm. And I've, I'm convinced that that day is not too far. I hope so. And think about Paul. I mean, we've, we just did a study on the book of Ephesians. How many times did we study in that whole quarter about we're a family, we're, you know? Especially Paul considered this a very important thing for Christians to understand. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 2, 19, Ephesians 4, and all those verses. Okay, moving on to the Bible study guide. Where are we? I guess, Jim, it's your turn. Well, I demonstrated a new way of living. Multitudes were, were attracted to the new community of faith. Acts 2, 
verses 46 and 47. In such a setting, being a disciple is not synonymous with simply accepting abstract propositional truths about Jesus. Being disciples of Christ was about learning from Jesus and modeling in life the knowledge of him. Can I interrupt for just a second? One time I was encouraged, I was asked to be a part of a witnessing group. And we went into a hospital. And these, these are, these are non-Adventist but Christian friends. Went into a hospital and we stood by a lady's bed. I don't know exactly what our disease or problems was. We didn't, obviously we didn't have access to that kind of information. And they said, do you believe that Jesus Christ did this and this and this? Yes. Okay, you are saved. God bless you. And I sort of stood there with my mouth hanging open. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, we had put, this brand of discipleship was both what the early believers did on behalf of Christ and how they represented Christ in the world. <clears throat> this communal culture of the New Testament where believers were integrated members of supportive groups became a fertile ground for the seed of the gospel to be sown and nurtured. Okay, let's ask, let's stop and ask ourselves a question here. Do you think people would be attracted if the Adventist church were a whole collection of small little groups that were really, I mean, loved each other, John 13, 34 and 35, met together, worshiped together, ate together. I mean, there's a lot of, we, we know from personal experience that, that this is, People love to join groups like this. People, isn't that a state of harmony? Yeah, isn't exactly. that a state of at one moment? Exactly. But it's not a, a, an atonement, atoning no. sacrifice, or no, a substitutionary no. sacrifice. I will, that, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this weekend, uh, I had an experience of talking to someone that lives in northern parts of the states, and she'd come down here and she observed our community. And she goes, you have such a wonderful community here. Mm. I can feel the, the warmth that mm. everybody has for each other. And we don't always recognize that within our own families. And it's nice when Loma Linda is not portrayed as Sin City, but as a community, a family. Yeah. Well, eternal life. All of this uh, somehow is, is yeah. <laughs> looking for yeah. eternal life. And what did Jesus say in John 17, 3? And Paul in uh, yeah. Philippians 2, learn to think like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And act like Jesus. Yeah. Well, if you're really thinking that way, that, yeah. that's, the, that's the net result. So uh, this, I think, uh, as Charles is sort of hinting over here, the day must come when, when people are, are attracted to the truth because of the way people live. And they say, man, you know, I, my e example that I have told sometimes, which is amazing, I was a member of a small church in a major U.S. city in the East Coast. We, I was there for about nine months doing some special training. And during that time, that small church almost doubled in size because it was doing this kind of stuff. And there was a pastor of another church who passed away. And this lady, the, his Not wife. An Adventist church. Huh? Not, an, Not Adventist. an Adventist church. The, his wife her, somehow heard about what was going on in our church. And we, the way we happened to go from where we lived to, to the church, we drove right past where she lived. And she said, would it be all right if mm -hmm. I ride with you to your church because Things are happening there. I mean, how often does that happen? Yeah. Today we have, we're in LA and the Consul General himself of this mm -hmm. country, of the mm -hmm. country, a Muslim country, saying he wants to come and attend our church once. Yes. What kind of a preaching is going to happen that day? Oh, that's, that's right? the scary part, baby. Right. Yeah. There you okay. are. He wants us to get together as a family. He wants to bring all the family friends, get together somewhere, and share with them 
a meal, an ideal meal. I mean, we as Adventists have such great opportunities yep. to that's, share that's the gospel. That would be beautiful, wouldn't it? Yes, yes. Okay, Acts 2, 46 and 47. Myra, you look like you're about to add something. Yeah. Okay. This is what happened. Day after day, they met as a group in the temple and they had their meals together in their homes, eating with glad and humble hearts, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Everybody was attracted. And every day the Lord added to the group those who were being saved. Could Healed. that happen? Go ahead. Healed. Yeah. Well, yeah. The missional sharing of one's faith, dimensional discipleship, is, is concerned with understanding the call to make disciples. In this case, Matthewsite in Matthew 28, 19, as essentially uh, called to engage in mission and duplicate oneself. This injunction is the primary command of the Great Commission, and it must remain the primary responsibility of the church in every context. Believers of the New Testament link together the notion of belonging to a community with the responsibility of sharing what that community stood for. Mission in the context of the Great Commission is more than a call to share the gospel with those who do not know Christ. Mission is both a call to share one's faith and to disciple interested recipients for the purpose of freeing them from the grasp of Satan so that they may fully and continually devote themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Wow. Hence, the New Testament uses the word disciple to indicate a relationship with and total commitment to Christ that comes as a result of learning and internalizing his teaching. Jim? That's what one meant. Being changed by continual growth in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18, living a life of total submission. Um, let's look at that 2 Peter 3.18 for just a second. but continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and forever. Continue to grow. Are we doing that? Living a life of total submission to his Lordship through the power of the Holy Spirit, Philippians 3.8, and helping others begin to experience trust and follow Jesus, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. I mean, this is all through the writings, well, it's through much of the Bible. From this perspective, Discipleship is not to be understood as a church program because it is not an event in time. Discipleship is rather a lifelong process of growing in Christ that transforms believers' cognitive, affective, and evaluative perspectives on life. That's a huh? good statement. Yeah. I say that a few times. Okay. Some perspectives on the current state of discipleship. Jim, I think that's yours, isn't it? I guess that's from the current state of discipleship. There is a consensus among Christian discipleship scholars today that compared to, the, compared to the New Testament, the current practice of discipleship has, to a great extent, lost its primacy of focus among Christians. The making of the disciples has largely been watered down to merely moving converts to Christianity into to Christian membership. Current oh, you, church. You just convince them that they need to join the church. Yeah, yeah. It's a numbers per, per, uh, perpetuation of the institution. Current church growth is perceived as largely numerical and statistical growth without much spiritual growth, unfortunately. Yes. In other words, Christians are, generally speaking, much better at converting people than they are at helping converts become, converts. helping converts become disciples of Christ. Sadly to say, this phenomenon implies that one can become a Christian without necessarily having to become a disciple of Christ. You know, the discipleship, a disciple of Christ, ultimately become persuaded in your understanding of, of God. But it's not forced down your throat. It's rationally Okay, we have absorbed. just a couple of minutes left. Let's look at a, a clear example. Carrie? Notice some very clear examples of how making disciples was done in the early church. Okay. As soon as she, in brackets, the woman of Samaria, had found the Savior, the Samaritan woman brought others to him, 
she proved herself a more effective missionary than his own disciples. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> the disciples saw nothing in Samaria to indicate that it was an encouraging field. Their thoughts were fixed upon a great work to be done in the future. They did not see that right around them was a harvest to be gathered. But through the woman whom they despised, a whole city full were brought to hear the Savior. She carried the light at once to her countrymen. The woman represents the work, working of a practical faith in Christ. Every true disciple is born in the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a giver. The grace of Christ in the soul is like a spring in the desert, welling up to refresh all and make those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. And that's just for Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages. Wow. Okay, Gordon, you want to take the next one there and we're about to cl conclude. Ellen White, God sp uh, expects personal service from everyone to whom he has entrusted a knowledge of the truth for this time. Not all can go as missionaries to foreign lands, but all can be home missionaries in their families and neighborhoods. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9. Okay. Not until the ordained minister only rests, not upon the ordained minister only, rests the responsibility of going forth to fulfill this commission, to carry the gospel to the world. Everyone who has received Christ is called to work for the salvation or healing of his fellow men, Jim. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth come. We, we need to stop there. The challenge is on all of us. This is a lesson that's going to, series of lessons that's going to really, uh, hopefully, take hold. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to discuss these things, to think about the challenges which are before us, and to, to learn maybe more clearly how we can serve you. May that be our experience as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.